Hello, good morning. Welcome to our July customer training session. Uh, as always, we're going to hang out for a minute or so so that we can give everyone a chance to log in. I wish you guys could see how fast those numbers are rolling up for us. It's actually a little bit exciting. I'm like, ooh, people are coming. <laughs> we're really excited about today because um, we have a special guest joining us. I'll introduce him in a moment, but it's always fun when we can bring in an expert so that you can get some more insight to what's happening as opposed to just Kevin and I talking to you all the time. Not that that doesn't have tons of value, right, Alicia? <laughs> Much value. How are you doing today, Kevin? I'm good. It's a beautiful day here in Colorado. My allergies are going crazy. So if I mute myself, I apologize. I'm, I'm realizing I'm just becoming old and have a lot of allergies. That's just my life now. So. <laughs> well, sometimes when we have a lot of smoke here in Colorado, it's, you know, most of just us. But I've heard that everyone across the country is dealing with smoke. So we're sorry. Sorry you're dealing with smoke, too. Our view of the peak is a little bit obscured, but... It also feels like we can't complain too much about it when we don't have the actual fires, right? Like, because <laughs> we've been there before. So thankfully that's not it. All right, well, let's see. We are two minutes after. I'm gonna start to make introductions and then we will jump into the content. For those of you that just joined, welcome to our July customer training webinar. Um, before we really get into it, I want to make sure you guys are aware of how you can communicate with us, how you can ask questions, how you can share uh, comments, exciting things with your other guests. You have a chat window down at the bottom, so you can open it up and say hello. I see people already doing that. Just so you know, the default se uh, setting in Zoom when you communicate is just to panelists, but if you want to communicate with panelists and attendees, you can change that blue drop down so that you can also, you know, make comments to your attendees like, oh, I love that. Or I've tried that before and it works. So we also have a Q&A box and I have two incredible uh, bomb bomb associates helping us out in there. We have Aaron and Vivian. So if you have questions, you want to make sure you put them into the Q&A box so they don't get lost. Things get lost in chat really quickly. So Vivian and Aaron are going to help answer questions. We will definitely take questions at the end. I know you guys are going to have some questions for our inbox, which brings me to why we're here today. We're talking about deliverability and specifically how to get your emails out of spam and into the inbox. I'm Alicia, I'm our national speaker. I'm joined by Kevin, our client enablement manager and our special guest today is Connor Vickery, our senior deliverability analyst. If you've ever been put in bomb bomb jail before, Connor <laughs> is probably the person that had to get you out of <laughs> bomb bomb jail. Welcome Convic. Hi, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Well, we're excited to have you. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, Kevin, if you can get us to that next slide. Yeah. Thank you. So our agenda for today, first, we're going to talk about the problem. And, and we all have experienced either a whole bunch of mail that we didn't want, or we have been the uh, <laughs> perpetrator of sending bad mail. The truth is, is that honestly, we've all probably done it. Every single one of us has probably sent mail that someone didn't want before, sent some bad email. But we're gonna talk about the problem. We're also gonna talk about your sending reputation. This is how your mail gets delivered. And uh, newsflash, bomb bomb doesn't get to make this decision. So we're gonna dive in deeper into the nuts and the bolts of sending reputation and deliverability. <laughs> And then, of course, we are going to make sure that you have best practices. You're going to walk away today understanding exactly what you need to do to make sure that your mail is hitting the inbox, that you're not getting sent into bomb bomb jail or, or Gmail jail or <laughs> Apple jail, any of those places where uh, email service providers decide to not deliver your mail. So that's what we're going to jump into today. Well, and I'm excited because I wanted to start this. We actually just had a Q&A come in from Jared, which is like a perfect lead into this. He's basically saying, I've sent 59 videos. I've had 19 of those watched, about 33%. What does BombBomb consider a good watch rate? Well, guess what? Our poll, which I'm going to launch right now is, 
what do you guys think is a good open rate? So there's a little bit of a difference in what Jared had mentioned there versus what I'm asking. An open rate is more of how many of your emails are actually getting opened and viewed. A watch rate would be a little bit more of my video is getting played. So just to clarify the, the slight difference there, but what do you assume is a good open rate on your emails? One of the really funny things, Connor, I'm sure you can speak to this more than anybody, but Alicia, I know you and I would get on even sales calls years ago when we were both on the sales team and somebody would be like, I'm getting an 80% open rate. Why aren't the other 20% opening my emails? Right? And I think this is a really good thing because setting those expectations is massively important when we're talking about deliverability and what should I hope for with sending my email. So I'm not going to give an answer quite yet on this. I'm going to let it simmer. We've got about 64%. So I'll give it about eight more seconds because then we've had it up for one minute. So if you haven't answered yet, answer now, get your answer in, get your answer in. And I'll go ahead and end this right now just so we can kind of look at what people's expectations are. So this is awesome. This is perfect. And, and Connor, I'm going to let you speak to this a little bit, but you guys can all see there that most of you think 50% would be a good open rate. Guess what? I do too. I think that would be a really good open rate. But Connor, talk a little bit to this on just what is a good expectation to have? What are some kind of averages as far as open rates goes from the email world? Yeah, and that's actually like a tougher question to answer than you think. Um, it really depends on who are you sending to, right? So if I'm sending to like a small group of my friends and family, I would expect a pretty high open rate, although I text my cousin and sometimes he doesn't reply back at all. So <laughs> even, even that's hard to expect, right? It's hard to expect 100% even from like your friends and family, your close loved ones. Um, so 50% is really, really good, especially if you're just sending to like a, a group of clients. Um, but I mean, honestly, I'm looking at things that are above like a 20% open rate. If I see a 20% um, and the other indicators in the data look good, then that's usually like a pretty good reason to keep moving forward with how you're doing your emails. So that's really good for us. So everybody that picked 50 or 100, this is really good for us to have as a framework as we go into this discussion. A 20% open rate on all of your emails is pretty darn good, right? That That's pretty good as far as those sort of things go. So keep that in mind. Now, there's a lot of different details to all of this, but if you're looking at all of your email sending all combined and you're averaging about a 20% overall, you're in good company. That's a good place to be. Those of you that picked 5%, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can be a little bit more specific and improve that because 5%, we want to be higher than that. If we're only getting a 5%, we're maybe not targeting the right people and those sort of things. So let me go ahead and close this down and let's kind of jump over to that. What is the problem thing? Alicia, talk to us a little bit about this. I know this is something that we've all been talking a lot internally at Bomb Mom about. Yeah. So essentially we like to really call this problem digital pollution. Now, this may be the first time you've heard this phrase. If you attended our session last week, you may have heard us kind of tease this idea of digital pollution, but digital pollution is really essentially any of the content shared over digital channels, whether it's email or social media or messaging or even text messages that is driving frustration, anxiety, confusion, annoyance, right? Those messages you don't wanna get because here's the thing. Digital pollution makes us skeptical about the messages we're receiving. It makes us not want to trust people. It reduces trust and transparency, and it makes it harder to build connections. So digital pollution is something we're all experiencing on a regular basis. When is the last time any of you went and took a peek at your spam folder? Because I did it in preparation for this, and it is scary, okay? I want to just see this for you guys, okay? Um, my hope today is that I can help you guys or that we can all help you start to think like an ISP, which is an internet service provider. They're the people that are actually having to protect us from the spam. They're the ones that decide what goes into spam or not. There are 270 billion emails sent every single day and half of them are spam. So these internet service providers are doing a lot of heavy lifting to protect you from the fraud, from the I have money for you, the try this drug. We are talking about an extreme amount of digital pollution, but digital pollution is not just the spam emails. So we kind of break digital pollution up into these three 
different sections. Uh, Kevin, if you can, there we go. So the first one that we like to talk about is innocent, okay? And innocent digital pollution is really, it's just the carelessness, right? The poor execution. You weren't, you know, sending a mass email to anyone, but it was received by the recipient as digital pollution because they didn't want it in that moment, okay? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you did something bad. It just means that the recipient did not want that message. They weren't interested in it. It wasn't good timing. It wasn't value. Because here's the thing about digital pollution. You don't get to decide if what you're sending is digital pollution. It's the recipient that really gets to decide, is this annoying? Is this frustrating me? Does this not bring value? Do I not want to get it? So innocent is really that first category of digital pollution. The second category is what we call consequential. Now, this just comes from the nature of doing business. If you have an email list, if you are sending marketing emails, you have likely been a perpetrator of consequential digital pollution. So again, this isn't intentional, but this comes from laziness or just maybe a bad email campaign or a poorly targeted message, right? If you sent something to your entire database that doesn't necessarily have value for all of those people, that's consequential digital pollution. So again, this isn't malicious. This isn't you intentionally trying to trick people, but sometimes just the nature of doing business means that you are sending email messages or text messages that people don't want, it causes them frustration or confusion, or they're just annoyed. I'll be honest with you, our marketing team here at BombBomb, we've been taking a really honest look at how are we contributing to consequential digital pollution? Where are we sending too many emails? Where are we not providing enough value and checking a box? If you are sending out email campaigns to check a box that you did your marketing and you are not being thoughtful, then you have been a perpetrator of consequential digital pollution, but we're gonna help you with this today. This isn't a, hey, you're doing bad. We're all doing this. We want to be better. And then this third category is really what we think about when we think of spam, okay? This is intentional. This is spam. This is phishing. Uh, this is those messages that people are trying to get things from you. These are fraudulent message. A lot of these end up in that spam folder, but. I wanted you to just have an understanding that this idea of, of polluting our digital spaces with just unnecessary noise is something that we're all doing. And we really have an opportunity to pull back and focus our energy in another place. Because here's the deal. If you remember what it was like when we loved getting email, right? When we got excited, when an email popped in, well, Obviously, we've had a shift where we have so much email coming at us that like we said at the beginning, it causes frustration and confusion and annoyance. And we wanna make sure that your messages are being heard, okay? Um, and this applies to text messages as well. We're talking mostly about email, but if you have started to be frustrated by the amount of sales or spam text messages or sales text messages that you're getting on your phone from unsolicited, we're trying to make sure that our communication channels give us an opportunity to really build relationships instead of just becoming noise, which is a great segue into what we believe is the solution for digital pollution. Well, and I, I think you brought up some really interesting stuff there, Alicia. I mean, one, I think that you said at the end there that's important to know is this is not just an email problem, right? This is, I mean, if I log into LinkedIn, I guarantee I will have two or three direct messages that are copy and pasted paragraphs from God knows what, trying to sell me, or I've got a great hiring opportunity for you, or you know whatever it may be. Those are really frustrating. I would put those directly under this category. Text messages now, I think about the last election cycle. Oh my gosh, my phone was blowing up with political text messages that I wanted nothing to do with, right? So all of these frustrations build up to one giant big problem. I think another thing that's so important that was eye-opening for me was these different classifications of, I am not a spammer. I don't send out spam emails. That doesn't mean I don't fall into this category from time to time, right? And so putting that thought. So the way that we've- 
I yeah, want to I want to say a comment on a comment in chat real quick because this is really applicable. Okay, mm -hmm. so Lisa said in chat um, just to the panelists, but she said she thinks some bomb bombs like the latest on throwing an Olympic party cross the line. But this is a really good point because. Um, she's referring to one of our prompt emails, which is automated campaigns that we send out every single month to people's databases. Now, again, the recipients get to decide what's digital pollution and what's a distraction. Lisa, I'll tell you, this isn't us tooting our own horn or me defending because we are sometimes perpetrators of digital pollution. But those types of content, the things like hosting a backyard party or some of those more fun, light and fluffy content pieces, our statistics show that those have the highest engagement from recipients. So, so for us, our, your recipients, now I don't know your specific recipients, but our data shows that the recipients of those kind of light and fluffy, fun, here's some tips for throwing a party, our recipients don't think they're pollution because we see some of the highest engagement on those. So again, this is why when we talk about really um, we're going to talk about tracking and auditing your lists. This is where it's helpful because, again, your recipients decide what's unwanted, not you. But great segue into our next point here for Kevin. Well, and I think that, that point is really, really valid. I think a lot of times we sit there and we think about, okay, I understand there's a problem. What is the fix? Where do we go from here? Well, we at BombBomb are actually working really hard on, on putting some terminology to this. And the terminology that we have have decided on and really settled on is this idea of human-centered communication, right? And I love the little kind of sub name there, thoughtful digital experiences. Alicia, you've mentioned this a couple of times in, in talking about the problem, but it's that we're only thinking about what our needs are a great majority of the time. And I can, I, I'm as guilty of this as anybody. When I was in real estate, I had a little box on my monthly tasks and I needed to send out an email. I had to get my email out. It got to the point of where I didn't care what I was sending. As long as I could check that box and be done with it, I was like, great, I did my job. That is not being thoughtful and being human-centered on what is the approach on this. So the first point I want you guys to think about with human-centered communication is that the recipient and the sender's needs are equal. And this is something that we all have to take a, a just kind of a, a break Alicia already mentioned, we here at BombBomb Bomb are taking a stop to think about this as well. And it's not just what do we need to provide? What do I need to send? What's my goal in this? If you're a salesperson, I just need to hit my quota. Right? I got to hit my quota this month. So I've got to get a bunch of emails out. No, it's thinking about what is the value that the recipient is going to receive from this as well. It's really important if you stop and honestly just take 15 seconds to think, is this valuable to this recipient or this group of people? It will vastly alter what you're sending to people because now we're thinking about them as people and we're considering them. Now, another way to think about this, kind of a deeper level of this too, is this idea of conversation over broadcasting. Connor, when we were prepping for this webinar, you wrote down this dialogue versus monologue idea. And Alicia and I both were like, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. The idea is not just to send a message and give people information, right? It's to like, all right, awesome. Now you have it. It's to start real conversations. It's to start a dialogue between two people. That's where the most value is going to be added. Does that mean we can't find a little value from, from val like tidbit emails or those sort of things? No, but where does it go from there? Alicia, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, and I we're gonna dive deeper into we're gonna dive deeper into this idea of of how that you can make sure that you are having a dialogue and not just a monologue because this is important for your business, right? It's important that you're actually building relationships and not just sending info at people. But as we dive deeper into deliverability, this is a huge factor in deliverability is how people are engaging with you. So we're going to get deeper into the technical aspects of what these ISPs are looking for, but this is really important to, and we're going to, like I said, we're going to dive deeper into how you can make sure this is happening, but this is a benefit for your business as well as getting your email delivered. Now, another rule of this too, is this is not just video emails, right? Well, obviously, Bama, we are talking about video emails a lot, but a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about are true for all of your emails. And that's kind of a good other section of human-centered communication. Of course, we know that video brings more of the human into the communication. So we're all about that. We know that it will help being more human-centered in the way that you're communicating with email. But just because you have a video in 
does not mean that it's human centered, right? How many videos have you seen out there that you're like, oh gosh, this is a marketing video that's got a thousands and thousands of people and vice versa. How many times have you actually received a text email or a text message that was very personal and was very human centered to you and it didn't have a video? So I don't want you to think that it's like, oh, if there's a video and this is a one-stop shop, I've got this solved. It's not. We still need to be really, really intentional with does the recipient want this? Do they need this? What value does it provide for them as well as me? And ultimately, the whole idea of human-centered communication and, and combating digital pollution is to build relationships. I guarantee that, that a vast majority of all of your businesses is built on the relationships that you're able to form. Even if it's a relationship for a couple of weeks to make a sale, if you don't form a solid relationship with that person, that sale might not happen. For those of you that are in our kind of VSB space, our, our real estate agents, our mortgage lenders, our insurance agents, you guys have a lot of recurring business. What causes that recurring business? A quality relationship. If you show these people that you value them, not just in the way that you treat them, but also in the way that you communicate with them, it's going to be so much more impactful on that. So I know I've been seeing some chats come in about, are we going to talk about some of the technical aspects and those sort of things? Yes. Let's jump into some of these pieces here. We've talked about what's the issue. What are some possible solutions for that? Before we dive into the actual things, I want to talk about some definitions so that we're all on the same page with these, right? So one word that we've already mentioned a few times is deliverability. Connor, will you talk to us a little bit and give us kind of a, a roundabout idea of what is deliverability and how does that fit to the email sending? It's funny if you type out this word, it gets the red underline because a lot of places don't recognize it as a real word, even though it's yeah. in my title. <laughs> um, it really is just, you know, the ability to deliver an email uh, into the inbox. So, but I kind of like to take it a step further. A lot of people just say, get it to the inbox, but um, I kind of want to get it more to like the, the folder you want to go to, right? Because there's part of the inbox is the spam folder and things like that. So you're trying to go to a specific spot. So it's like, how, what is our ability to get to the, the email to the primary folder instead of like the promotions or the spam folder. And that's a really good thing to clarify too, right? I mean, we can tell so much on our end with our tracking. We can tell that it's been delivered, but really deliverability takes it that step further. Is, is it getting into the right folders? Is it getting into the places we want it to be? And, and two things here. Number one, I think it's important for you all to understand again that, that BombBomb is not the person that makes the decision on this, right? It is the recipient's email service provider. It's the recipients that are deciding where this is gonna go. So, you know, we wanna help you with, with giving you a, a structure, but the rules that we're giving you today, the frameworks, the suggestions, this isn't like BombBomb's rules. This is because the internet service providers, again, are filtering through those 270 billion emails. And, and we know that there is frustration between um, Gmail primary tab and promotions tab. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as some best practices. Um, but what you need to understand is that from Gmail's perspective, if you are sending out a mass communication to your database, they are correctly categorizing that as promotional email. But there are ways that you can get your people <laughs> to interact with that so that it doesn't keep going to promotion and it goes to primary, but we'll get into that. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. The second kind of term that we teased at the beginning is you're sending reputation. Uh, Connor, tell us a little bit about what a sending reputation is, and then we're going to go through some, some negative aspects that can create negative engagement on that and some positive engagement. So what is a sending reputation as a whole? Sure. Uh, think of it kind of like a credit score almost. I've, I've heard it conflated with that quite a bit, um, where it's something that can go up and down based off of your behavior as a sender. Um, and you have a reputation with inbox providers like Gmail, Yahoo, Outlook, et cetera. Um, then there's some third parties out there that they oftentimes reference, but we won't get into those because that's usually for like very large, uh, very mass marketing email systems. Um, but for our types of senders, um, like this more, you know, smaller batch sends and sending to like personal emails, we're going to be dealing with like the in inbox providers uh, categorizing mail. And you're going to have a sending reputation for yourself as a sender on the email address you're using or the domain that you have. So if you have like a website that you're sending from, such as at bombbomb.com, uh, that's going to have a reputation as well as the mail servers you send from. So BombBomb, the platform, has its own reputation, uh, which we upkeep. Um, and then that's why sometimes we put people in BombBomb jail, as Felicia mentioned. Uh, is if they're if we think that they're kind of harming their reputation, we work with them to help them send healthier mail 
no one's ever locked in jail forever. We try to work with those users um, and help them send better mail. Um, but then there's also the reputation for you yourself. So even if you left the BombBomb platform, that reputation is going to follow you wherever you go. So your reputation is not based on each individual platform. For example, if somebody leaves and goes to a complete other, we'll say they, they leave a Gmail email and go to Yahoo or something like that, they will continue to carry some of that reputation with them. Is right. that correct, Connor? Okay. I think that's important to know because I know I had a lot of people that would be like, oh, I'm just going to go to MailChimp and start sending stuff over here. Or I've been at one of those senders. I'm not talking ill on MailChimp at all, but I've been at one of those and have not, I don't have the best reputation from there. That's why I'm coming to BombBomb is so that I can start from scratch. You're not starting from scratch, right? We carry this with us. So it's really important that we do that. So what are some of the negative, I'm going to show kind of a list here as far as negative engagements, things that are going to start giving you a negative sending reputation. Um, Connor, talk a little bit about those first two bullet points, getting reported for spam and being marked as spam. What's the difference between those? And, and just to clarify a little bit. Totally. Um, so when you open up an email, like if it's in Gmail or whatever, the inbox provider will oftentimes have like a report spam button built into the email itself. That's going to be what that is. is if someone goes and actively reports the email as spam. So that's like human action and it's human negative action to go and say, this is spam, right? Um, and also bomb bomb on all of our emails uh, by law. And then also just because it's best practice, we add a report abuse button at the bottom of all of our emails that we send out at mass. Um, so that people can report things directly to us as well. So we monitor those. Um, and then on the being marked as spam, that's if someone like takes your email and drags it to their spam folder. So they're not necessarily going out of the way to report it as spam, like saying, hey, this is absolutely unsolicited and even maybe going out of the way to leave a comment with that. They're just moving to the spam folder. They're like, you know what? I'm not really interested in this. I don't really want to see this. So they're just kind of marketing as spam. So I have a question for, for, um, to differentiate these two here. So if someone actually marks your email as spam or abuse, when you're sending from BombBomb, we let them know, right? Because that ends up in your suppression list. However, if someone drags your email into spam, would you know, or would you never even know if they had done that? I won't know. Um, and that's why it's important to look at your open rates a lot too and your other forms of engagement because you wanna look at your data as a whole, right? So maybe they did drag your email to the spam folder. It's likely that you're no longer gonna be getting opens from that person. So it's important when you're creating lists or looking through your contacts, if you have a contact that's gone like five emails in a row without opening anything, then maybe you're going to their spam folder. Um, maybe they're not seeing your email at all. Maybe they're just not interested. Either way, they're kind of dragging down your open rate, which goes into this other part of this, of the, the negative engagement is having like a low open rate, right? So like I said earlier, I look at a 20% open rate or higher and I try to keep things above that. I think that's healthy. And that's kind of telling inbox providers, hey, at least 20% of these people want these emails and are interested in seeing them. But if you're drifting below that, like 15% or lower, then people are kind of detracting away from your mail. Inbox providers are looking, in that, looking at that and saying, hey, this person uh, doesn't have a whole lot of engagement. There aren't a whole lot of opens going on here. Maybe most of the people are not interested in this mail. Um, and so if you're getting those low open rates, it's good to just kind of call those people out of your, your contacts. I think that's really important. And, and I'm going to say it again for people that are, you know, multitasking, okay? The deliverability expert is saying that for mass sending, right, when you're sending to big lists, 20% is anything over 20% he looks at and considers healthy, okay? So obviously you want more engagement and we wanna help you have more engagement, but 20% is considered healthy. Anything less than that, then the email service providers are gonna start looking at you as maybe not a healthy sender. So that's really, really good there. So we've talked about some of the negative stuff. Obviously maybe- Let's talk you about more thing to touch on. Let's talk about bounce and unsubscribe though, because I think these are important too. Sure, sure. What is a bounce rate specifically, Connor? Sure. So um, when you're sending an email off, like the sending mail server is going to hand the email to the receiving mail server. The receiving mail server, if it can't deliver the email for whatever reason, uh, will give you back a bounce message. That bounce message will usually tell you why it couldn't deliver it. Um, but you don't want to run into repeat bounce messages and you don't want to have high numbers of those, right? Because if I have a super high bounce percentage, I'm kind of telling inbox providers that I haven't done a very good job of making sure my list is up to date because um, a lot of times bounces come from out of date addresses and things like that. You don't want to run into a lot of bounces because you're kind of just red flagging inbox providers. Hey, I don't keep my list up to date. 
right? Or I just purchased this list. That's why there's so many invalids. You don't want to have a high uh, bounce rate from that reason. Um, and then the unsubscribe rate is when people just opt out of your emails. Not really that bad in low numbers. That's going to happen naturally. But if you have tons of people unsubscribing, um, that's not great either. That's that's kind of adds to that whole overall negative engagement. And again, look at these as a blanket thing. Don't just say, "Well, I've you know I've got one of these, therefore I'm in trouble." If you have multiple of these, then you start to get in trouble. So you're kind of looking at these as a as a whole blanket. I think it's also interesting to think about these from the recipient standpoint and like the ISP standpoint, right? Gmail's entire goal is to protect their person. Right. They want to protect their clients. They don't care about us as the sender. So that's why all of these things are in place. That's why they are looking at things. And in reality, we are all benefiting from these to a degree as well because they are blocking these things from coming to us. So it's hard to get stuck into this mindset of when I send, things are not getting to all the videos or the, all the folders that I want them to. But we also have to think about, like Alicia said, take a look at your spam folder and you will be very glad that that's in place for you from a personal standpoint. So keep all of this in the context of both sides. And we're going to give you some direct ways on, on how we can help improve some of these things so that you're not just stuck in that point as well. So let's look at some of the positive stuff. We've looked at some of the things to avoid or keep an eye on as far as the bounce rates and the open rates and the unsubscribe rates. What are good things that, as far as positive engagement that, that build your reputation in a positive way? Obviously, we've talked about open rates. So the averse of low is going to be high. That's a good thing, right? What about more clicks being marked as important? What are some of those options there, Connor? Explain. I didn't even know him being marked as important was an option. So that's an interesting sure. one for me to learn. So the being marked as important is kind of like the opposite of being marked as spam. Like, let's say I have an email in my inbox and I want to just star it, make sure I'm going to read it later, or it's in my promotions folder and I drag it over to my primary folder. Those interactions are actually monitored by inbox providers as well. Um, and those are those interactions are telling inbox providers that those people are interested in your mail. So they're looking at all those little tiny interactions um, and replies as well. So going back to what we said earlier, dialogue versus monologue. Um, if you're going for a dialogue, you should be getting replies, right? And if I reply to an email, the next time that person emails me, it's more than likely to go to my primary folder, not somewhere else, because I've set that precedence with the inbox provider and engaging with my inbox. This is really important and we're going to dive more into this when we get into these like best practices. But if you are multitasking, again, Connor just said that if you sent an email and it went to promotions tab, but the person replied to that email, the likelihood that Gmail is going to put it in their primary next time skyrockets. So this is really important for you to think about building in opportunities for people to engage with you because this tells inbox providers that you're doing a good job, that you're a good sender. One thing that I think is interesting too, I would like you to clarify what clicks are because I think those could be determined, interpreted as a lot of different things. How do you guys look at that from a deliverability standpoint? Sure. Um, so one thing that's interest or that's uh, important to keep in mind with clicks or plays as we were talking about earlier is that those are going to happen after the open, right? So if you have a 20% open rate, it's unlikely that your play rate and click rate are going to be higher than that because the open has to happen first, right? So you have the person seeing the subject line and that triggers them to open the email if it's in the right place in their inbox. And then once they're in the email itself and they click on something in the email. So it's a, it's a second level of engagement. It's that extra step of engagement and that's being monitored too. So if someone, it's kind of like a reply, not only did they open the email, but they also took the time to go click on the link in there or reply in there or watch the video. And that engagement's monitored as well. So if someone's that engaged, man, they must really want your email or must be really engaged with what you're sending. So it's important to think of an entire email experience as kind of a journey, right? There, And we're going to talk you through a framework, actually, in just a second here on how to do that. But when we, as we're transitioning into best practices here, what's the first step in this journey? It's how do I get them into my email, right? We all get, I think I read that the average is about 125 emails a day is kind of the national American average. So how do we get somebody from seeing all of these 125 emails to actually engaging with ours specifically? This is probably not going to be shocking to you, but that first kind of weapon, that tool that we have is going to be our subject lines. Alicia, do you want to talk through some of these best practices on how to get people engaged with us, yep. the best uses for subject lines there? So your subject line is obviously the first indication that person, someone is looking at to decide whether they're going to open it or not. So 
first best practice here is that your subject lines, you want them to be less than seven words. I've seen ones that said seven to nine words, um, but this is something that inbox providers look at. Convic, correct? Yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> So a subject line is one of those first things that the inbox provider is looking at. So you want it to be less than seven words. You don't want a big, long subject line. But you also want to create curiosity, right? You want the subject line to be something that piques their interest. Um, like three ways to such and such or whatever your topic is here. Putting numbers in your subject line. This is a great way to create uh, curiosity personalize. I cannot tell you how beneficial it is to you if you can personalize a subject line. We are psychologically drawn to our names. We've all heard this statistic before about if you hear your name in a crowded place. It's the same way in the inbox. If you can make a subject line personal to someone either with their name or referencing something that will be familiar to them. If you had a phone conversation about the Milwaukee Bucks, hopefully winning it all, right? If you're sending them an email and you reference the Milwaukee Bucks today, they are going to open it because it's personal. It has that personal trigger, trigger for them. Uh, video is actually really a powerful word to have in your subject line if you want people to play your videos. Uh, putting video in the subject line does not actually increase open rates. Our stats have showed us that it hasn't. However, putting video in the subject line increases play rates. So if you want people to play your video, it is going to be helpful for you to put video in the subject line because it's letting them know what they're going to find when they open the email um, this last one is important. You really want to avoid spammy language in your subject lines. Uh, words like free or last chance today, um, using all caps or excessive punctuation or um, emojis can be helpful in a subject line. But if you do too many, it kind of falls in that excessive punctuation. So you really want your subject line to be clear, concise, and personal if possible. Can I touch on this one a little bit? Yes, um, the most important out of all of these, in my opinion, is the personalize. Um, the, if you go go look, I encourage everyone after the webinar to go and look at your promotions folder versus your primary folder. So in Gmail at the top, promotions versus primary, and look at the subject lines in your promotions folder. I still go to my promotions folder all the time and click on those, but you will see all of these practices kind of not in use, you'll see lots of uh, emojis and things like that. And these like very kind of ad type subject lines, whereas the emails in your primary folder will all be much more personalized and as if they're continuing on a conversation you've already had. I think it's interesting as well with all of these things to go, not only are the ISPs looking at these, are the algorithms evaluating a lot of these things, but think about it if you're getting these emails, right? If I'm getting an email that has free in all caps and exclamation points, I immediately, that trigger goes off immediately in my brain. Even if it got to my inbox, I'm out. I'm not opening that email, right? I know. And I would tell you a best practice that I have kind of learned in the lots of emails that I've sent out is with that personalized option. I personally do not personalize with a person's full name. I'm not going to put, hey, Alicia Baruti, take a look at this email. That again, my antennas pop up and go, oh gosh, this was probably pulled in from some list or pulled in from a CRM. It was auto-populated versus if I see an email that says, hey, Kevin, take a look at this. I'm like, oh, maybe they know me. I, it just automatically feels more personalized. I don't know if there's any science to that. So I'm not going to give you a bunch of stats. I just know from a preference standpoint and from sending lots of emails and watching what's engaged with, that has helped me a lot with that personalization thing is just kind of having the first name instead of the, the, the full name there. So I know we, you guys know about subject lines to an extent. So that's a, it's a really important thing, but let's kind of go deeper in next level of this journey. We want to talk about the body of the email, because this is going to affect your engagement and those sort of things as well. So number two here for best practices is what we're calling the image to text ratio. So Alicia, I'm going to let you break this down a little bit of once we get into the email, what does it look like? How should we formulate that to get those clicks? those plays, the replies, those things that are really going to help with that positive engagement that you get? So there's two different things here with the image to text ratio, okay? Number one, um, ISPs do look at this, okay? Now, it's not as important as some of the other things, but if you send an email 
that's just a video, which ISPs look at that as, a, as an image because it's a gift there. Uh, and then a whole bunch of images and there's not text in there. They sometimes will see that as a spammy email if it's all images, but there is an even more important reason why you want to make sure that you have text wrapped around your video. <laughs> <laughs> they had something to they had some things to say about this. They're very passionate about the body of emails. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> sorry guys, real world. I'm almost back to the office, but we're still dealing with dogs. Okay, so a couple things. Number one, uh, if you do not put text above your video, some inboxes pull an inbox preview, okay? That inbox preview usually pulls the first couple lines or the first few words of your email and it puts it after the subject line. If you are sending a video in an email and there's no text above that video and their inbox decides to pull an inbox preview, what's going to be after your subject line is jumbly video code, okay? So that's reason number one. So you want to make sure that your text above the video tells them to play the video. Something as simple as, hey, Kevin, it was great to catch up today. I recorded a video with a follow-up to your questions, right? Something simple, whatever it is. Or... Hi, Convic. So excited to connect later. Press video for information about our call, whatever it is, okay? So that you want to have text above the video. Then you have your video, right? Nice, big, and central. You've got your GIF file that tells them what it is. Or if you're sending perhaps from our keyboard and you're sending your email, it'll just be the link. So again, you really want to make sure you have text telling them, I recorded you a video. Press play on the video. Now, you want to make sure that you have text below the video, and this is really, really important. My multitaskers need to pay attention, okay? If you have ever sent a bomb bomb video to someone and they replied and said, I didn't see a video, there is a chance that if you did not put text below the video that the message was truncated. Kevin, can you click on that one more time for me? With those dreaded three dots, okay? If you put text below your video, even if it just is something as simple as thank you, okay? It can't be your subject line. That's a separate thing. It needs to be a line of text. If you put that line of text below the video, they're not going to smush the message and that video thumbnail is going to be visible. So again, you want text above the video, doesn't have to be a lot. You want your video and then you need text below the video. This is going to help make sure, number one, that you're getting the click. A video play is a click. This is good engagement from an ISP. Again, the video is there to help you build the relationship and make that human connection. You wanna make sure that they are seeing your video and playing your video and that the ISPs or the email service providers that are seeing this knows that there is more than just images in that email. Yeah, and I love that last little point just to add on to it as well, Alicia, a CTA, a call to action, right? This is how we start some of those conversations, the, the dialogue versus the monologue. It's also giving other people active links that they can click on. The yeah. more opportunity, now I'm gonna say this with context, the more opportunities they have to click, usually the, the higher engagement we're gonna get. But please don't throw 30 links in your emails. That's not going to look very good, right? So take all of this with a grain of salt. If you have important link or two or a call to action or things like that, add them in there. Make sure that they can click because not only is that easier for the recipient, it also is going to look really well for your, your sending and your reputation and building up some of those sort of things. There was something in chat that I thought was a great point that I do just want to clarify. Someone said, what about when we're using a bomb bomb template? There's no place to put text above the video. If you are using a template, you don't need to worry about having the text above the video. Um, the template kind of changes that. We're talking specifically about popping a video into another email. You need to make sure you have that text above and below. But also, right. just to let everybody know, I know we have a good amount of questions in the Q&A right here. We're going to try and leave a few minutes at the end of here to make sure we're answering some of these questions. So we're not ignoring those, I promise. We just want to make sure we get through some of these best practices for you so we have time to answer those kind of at the end here. So best practice number three. Um, I'll jump in on this one because I think this is one that we all have been guilty of to some extent. The I've always done it this way mentality, right? Well, I've just always done it this way. Yeah, unfortunately, so have a lot of people. And that's why we have 138 billion spam emails going out every day. 
we're, we're part of the problem. And so just because it's something that I've sent out this monthly email for five years, does that mean you should always keep doing it? No. Evaluate what is the value? Who are you sending to, right? If I've got a list of 300 people that I've been sending emails to for the last five years, and I've never gone and looked at that list and evaluated who's opening, who's clicking, what engagement am I getting? What value am I providing? We're becoming more and more a part of the problem, right? Alicia, you and I talk a lot about how every email, every video we send is training people, whether they're going to engage or open or watch the next one. Unfortunately, that could, you could have somebody on your list from three years ago that has not opened a single email the entire time. Yeah. But if you don't take time to analyze this, if you get stuck into, this is just what I do every month, then our reputation is going to keep getting worse and worse and worse with these. So really take time. And I love that honest is highlighted there, right? Take an honest look at your list. We all want to have big lists. It's more important to have impactful lists and valuable specific lists than it is to have a thousand people on your list. You can make a deeper impact with 200 people that really want your emails than a thousand people that might or might not. So it, it, take the numbers out of your mind and, and really be honest with yourself with some of those sort of things. Well, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about segmenting here, but I think it's important that you understand that we're not saying, you know, <laughs> delete everyone off your list and start from scratch with only the people that opened your last email. But you might need to take a really honest list, a look at what you're sending and to what lists. You know, maybe you've been sending, maybe you're a real estate agent and you've been sending, you know, a market update every single month for the last two years. You might need to take a really honest look at this and see who's engaging with this. Because the people that are engaging with that market update are obviously interested and they keep wanting that. But what about all the other people? What about the 80% of people that are engaging with it? I'm not saying don't send to them anymore but maybe you need to send them something that has a different kind of value for them. So when we talk about segmenting your lists, this is an opportunity for you to increase your engagement by sending more specific things to groups of people that they're going to be interested and engaged with instead of just sending to that same massive list over and over and over again. And I think the Second thing here is really important. Um, you're not allowed to use bot lists at BombBomb. Bomb. That's not because we're mean. It's because it's the law for <laughs> canned spam laws. Um, but we know that there's still ways to get around this. You may have harvested a list or bought a list in the past that, you know, wasn't doing so well. You need to be honest about, about these things with yourself um, because this isn't about, you know, this isn't for our benefit. This is for your benefit of getting people actually engaged with you. I think you brought up a really interesting point. And then this really, we're going to segue perfectly into the fourth, fourth best practice here. But I think there are also ways for lack of engagement or negative engagement to create real conversations. To Alicia's point of if I've got somebody that's not opening any of my emails, what could be a really neat opportunity? Maybe I send them a one-to-one -one email or I call them or I reach out to this person and say, hey, we haven't talked in a while. I want to catch up. And in that conversation, you can find a way of, I know I've been sending you these monthly emails. Do you enjoy those? Do you not want those? What would you like more? Use that as a way to create a real positive engagement, a real build, a real relationship. And it started from something that could be negative and you're turning it into a positive opportunity there. So keep those in mind as well. Again, we're not saying get rid of all those people, find opportunities for those people as well to where you can build on that. And this kind of goes a little bit into number four here, Connor, and I'll let you talk a little bit about this, but segmenting your lists. I'll let you expand on this one because I know this is something that you talk a lot about. Sure. Um, and honestly, the part you guys were just talking about ties into this really well. If you're the type of person that sends out a newsletter like once a month um, and you're getting that 20% open rate and you're, of course, you want to reach those other 80% of people, but you have to ask yourself, are you jeopardizing your ability to reach them? And are you even reaching them anymore? Right. So over time, if they've become disengaged, where are your emails going eventually? If I stop opening emails from a specific sender, eventually those emails are going to get categorized by my inbox into the spam folder or the promotions folder. And so that person, by not removing me from that, just that basic marketing email, um, even after looking at my lack of opens, is kind of jeopardizing their ability to send emails to me correctly. Right. 
So instead of just letting those people go for a really long time without opening, change up your strategy to those people. Like Kevin said, look at that as an opportunity to reach out on more of a one-to-one -one basis. Then once they re-engage and you get them kind of pulled back into the fold, then you can start sending them those larger emails, right? So this is kind of ties into that segmenting list here. So if you've got a thousand people per se, and you have a 20% open rate, take those 200 people, those, that 20%, and use that as like your core marketing list. You know they're engaged with this type of mail and then change up your strategy to those other 800. Can those other 800 be broken down by further categorization? Are they all in a specific zip code? Um, did they all meet you at a specific open house? Is there some type of pattern that you can really drill into to, to create a similarity between them and then create lists based off of that? We um we had a um one of our bomb bomb members who was at our rehumanized conference a couple of years ago did an entire session on segmenting lists. Now this was a real estate guy, and I just gave an example there in that second bullet point for someone who was in real estate. I don't know your business. You all have different businesses. We have so many different industries here, but. When you're talking about staying relevant and staying in front of people and maintaining those relationships, it is not about checking a box and saying, oh yeah, I sent an email to my database this month, I'm good to go. It's about offering value. If you are not providing value to these people, they're not going to keep opening your email, which is going to hurt the relationship. So, you know, this was just some bullet pointed suggestions wherever you're a real estate agent, but you should be segmenting out your clients that might be retiring soon and downsizing versus your growing families or your luxury market or the people that are sending you referral relationships versus people who aren't or the leads that you never converted, you should not be sending the exact same things to them that you are sending to your people that you have solid relationships with. So um, this stat actually came from, I believe it was MailChimp that um, this stat came from, but segmented lists like targeted lists have a 14.3% higher open rate and an over 100% higher click rate, okay? It is not about checking an e a box that you sent an email. It's about segmenting your lists to make sure that you are providing appropriate value for that audience. Well, and all of this really ties into to best practice number five, right? And we've mentioned this a lot of times. So I don't know that we need to go much deeper into this. Connor, if you have anything to add, please do. But make sure that you're constantly tracking your open rates and engagement. I don't mean you need to spend an hour every single day. But if you're sending out a monthly email list, you need to be scheduling time for yourself a few days after or a week after to go in and analyze that. You need to be doing this on a regular basis. And really, I think this leads into the, our last tip, which is, I would argue the most important in a lot of this that I've learned from talking with you, Connor, but it's building good habits, right? I think it's easy to think, oh, if I just am more focused on this email, then, I, then my reputation is going to get better. It's going to only improve from there. One email is probably not going to fix all of the problems that we've spent 10 years building up. We have to build good habits. We have to start thinking about our recipients with that human-centered mindset. We have to about start thinking about that and processing it and contemplating it on every email we're sending. That might seem exhausting. So I don't want to stress you out by thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to do that all the time. But analyze these emails. Before you click send, spend five seconds thinking about, is my recipient going to want this? If you can honestly say, yeah, they're going to be excited about this, Click send, don't think about it again. If you're not sure, maybe take a few more minutes to rethink about that and analyze that. Make sure that we're not just monologuing, we're, we're communicating, we're building a lot of these points that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, Connor, do you have anything to add on the, the tracking and the building of good habits and the longevity of these best practices? Well, I think not only does it help your open rates as a person, but that cascades into helping your sending reputation like we talked about earlier, right? So then your sending reputation is better because your open rate's better and everything else is better. And then your emails start to go to the primary folder more often. So it all just kind of benefits this giant ecosystem that you're a part of. It's awesome. It's so good to think about. And I know there, I wish there was like a cheat code for all of this where we could be like, oh, just change this setting in your email and everything will go where you want. Unfortunately, it's not. It's not that simple. And that's why we want to give you different options for best practices so that you can pick some things to start focusing on. So just to recap, and then I want to leave the rest of this time here um, for any questions, because I know we've got a lot of questions. And, and since we've got Connor here, I want to make sure we utilize his expertise. But uh, we're all sick of the digital pollution. We're all, none of us like that. 
let's do our best to make sure that we are not contributing to that, right? And that we're, we're really being human centered in the way that we're thinking about all of our communications. I don't care if it's email. I don't care if it's text message. I don't care if it's cold calls and who we're calling or social media. Think about the other person on the other end of this phone as you're making these calls, as you're sending these emails out. And also, I think this is important to know your reputation follows you. It lives with you everywhere you go. So if you start just tanking it and not carrying over here and then decide, I'm going to jump ship and go somewhere else, it's going to follow you. It will find you. Guess what? Google's really smart. They make a lot of money. And they make a lot of money by doing these things and knowing how to be smarter than me as an email sender. So don't think you're going to outsmart these ISPs. Let's be responsible with everything that we're sending from there and build the good habits, right? This is not a one fix. This is not a great, I'm going to be really good for today. It's every time we're communicating, let's make sure we're, we're building those habits. So our homework for you guys this month is that we want you to take a look at your lists. I know you're all so thrilled that we're challenging you to do this, but it's so important. Think about some of the things that Connor and Alicia both mentioned on how are we being specific with who we're sending to. Um, Connor actually corrected me when I was building this. I had some notes on here that said, delete all of your unsubscribe. Then he goes, no, don't do that. We want to suppress them. We want to keep a list of all the people that have unsubscribed so that we don't send to them again. If we delete them all, they disappear and we don't know, right? Suppress old contacts, update old contacts, find those as opportunities to reach out and go, hey, I've noticed your email has not been going to your email address. Did you get a new one? Can I update that? Would you like some of this information that I have to offer? And then we've talked about segmenting lists, right? Taking these massive thousand person lists and segmenting them down into more targeted things. If you're a salesperson, maybe you have inbound leads, get specific with those inbound leads. Maybe you've outbound and built relationships, build them into their own segmented list so that the content and the value that you provide to them is way more specific to what they need. So I would challenge all of you, time block an hour. Pick an hour where you can spend some time dissecting this. I know it's not fun, but it will help. I promise you that. So let's jump into some of this Q&A stuff because we've got well, three more minutes, but we may even go a minute or two long. Yeah, but. we have a lot of questions and a lot of really great questions. So I'm just going to let you guys know. We are going to hang out. We're going to hang out for a handful of minutes over the top of the hour to answer questions. If you asked a question that you are waiting to get answered, we will do our best we're not gonna be able to answer all of them, but we do wanna answer some of these questions while we have Convict. If you have to go, we understand, um, but we are gonna hang out. So um, I wanna make a real quick distinction though, before we dive into these questions, because I've seen it a couple times in the Q and A about like, so you're saying if we send from BombBomb or you're saying if we send with a template, it goes directly to spam. Guys, there is a big difference between spam and the promotions tab, okay? This is really, really important. And I've been working at BombBomb Bomb for six years and I've been answering this question for six years, okay? Spam is Gmail looking at this message and saying, my recipient doesn't wanna see it. This is bad email, this is junk. I'm gonna hide it so they don't see it, okay? A promotions tab is Gmail correctly labeling mass communication for the purpose of marketing in the promotions tab, okay? If you are sending one-to-one -one video emails, they're not gonna go to the promotions tab, okay? It's gonna go to the primary. If you are sending a mass communication to 2,500 people and Gmail puts it in the promotions tab, they did the correct thing. Now, we said it in the best practices. If you want those emails to stay out of the promotions tab, try asking a question in your video. Say, reply to this email and let me know what such and such, or reply to this email with, if you are getting them to reply or answer a question, then Gmail is gonna say, oh, okay, this isn't marketing material. This is communication. And they're gonna put it in the primary tab, okay? So it's a really important distinction that you understand. Now, Convec, I'm gonna throw this question to you because we've seen it a lot and, and it may have been worded incorrectly about spam, but if you're sending from a templated email, is that going to affect your sending reputation? Are you going to get better engagement rates sending just a video from Gmail versus sending a templated email? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think it really goes back to the precedence that you have with that recipient, right? So if I'm emailing to 10 people that I have had correspondence with before, or they've opened my emails in the past, 
if I send them like an email with a template or a lot of marketing in it, then the composure of the email is not going to matter as much. What matters to the inbox provider is my history with that person. Um, is that person engaged in my emails? So when you should consider this is when you're emailing someone for like the first time. If I have a new lead coming in, I'm not going to just add them to my mass marketing emails or my monthly update that has the template and all the images and stuff, because it's just, they're, it's not going to look personal to them. But if I email them like a one-to-one -one video email or just a regular Gmail email and kind of reach out to them first, since they just came in, I should introduce myself on a personal level. Um, then, then that historical precedence will start to take place. And then my next emails can be more image heavy and have templates and things like that. Um, and that's going to be a little bit more delivered a little bit more correctly. There's kind of a theme of questions that I've gotten a ton when I talk about sending email and deliverability. And it's people always asking about how accurate are open rates? Are they real? Are there issues that affect that? I mean, Christy actually asked this specifically, but you know, if somebody has like Outlook set up to open all emails in a separate screen, then would it affect open rates? I know that's a big question in a lot of ways, Connor, but what are some of the potential things that could affect your open rates not being 100% accurate or, or how do you typically answer that? I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, there are some inbox providers out there that do try to hide open rates, but you have to also consider that um, inbox providers like Gmail are trying to curate, like it's everyone's part of a big ecosystem that we're all sharing, right? So they actually don't want to hide or give off incorrect open rates because that gives bad data for you as the sender to act upon. So if they're just giving tons of false opens, which they have in the past, but they do a good job to try to correct that. That does happen sometimes. Sometimes you have filters triggering opens on emails, um, but that doesn't happen all the time and it's not at mass. Um, when that does start to happen, they try to correct it, but they want to give you accurate data and they want your platform like BombBomb to have accurate data to go off of so that you can send better mail. Because if they weren't, if they didn't give you that data, then everyone would just be shooting in the dark. We wouldn't have this, this engagement data to go off of to send more curated emails. We had a question around, um, someone wanted to know if there is a website or a place that you can go to find out your online reputation. Is that something that people can do? There's um, tons of, you can go Google like uh, sending reputation stuff, tools um, and things like that. And there's tons of those that will kind of give you a generalized uh, feedback on that. But one email tool that I use pretty often, and this is not to gauge like your personal reputation, but just your uh, deliverability as a whole, what it does is it checks you against a bunch of third-party reputation sources um, and then kind of analyzes the like the text of your email. Is it authenticated? Things like that is uh, spamtester.com. Uh, so if you like, I think it's a, well, hold on. Let me make sure I'm getting the right, the right site before I tell people to go to the site. While you're looking that up, Connor, I just came across a question that I think is really important that we address with as many people on here. Should I take out suppressed emails from my contact list? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. That might be your most important list that you have is your suppression list. Make sure that those are marked appropriately and they are in a suppression list, especially. So BombBomb automatically does this for you is we will create this suppression list and then we monitor that when you click send to make sure we're not sending to anybody on that list. Do not delete them. Make sure that we keep them in there. It's really important for us to know so that we don't keep sending to those people that don't want your emails for whatever reason. That's going to help a lot with your sending reputation. So just a quick answer while you're looking that up. Yeah, and I found it. It's a mail-tester.com. Um, and you can just send in, they'll give you an email address, a test email address to send to. You send to that and then you load the page and it'll kind of give you like a breakdown of how healthy your email is. Um, they're not going to know everything. A lot of stuff that you should be looking at is your own data of your own opens and things like that. But that kind of helps to know if like you're on any spam lists or anything like that, um, any like bad reputation sources. Um, also on the suppression list on not deleting su suppressed contacts, you should also go and update your suppression list into other platforms and vice versa. So if you're sending from any other email platforms, if you have a CRM that's able to send emails, make sure your opt-outs and invalids are updated across those platforms. So if you have someone opt out of that platform, make sure they're opted out or suppressed in BombBomb as well. So you're not sending to people that have already opted out in the past. I saw a couple questions in here, people asking about the changing email uh, addresses, or I saw someone asking a question about, I changed the name of my list when I switched to BombBomb. Uh, how would the email service providers know? I think it's important for you guys to remember that your sending reputation is more like a digital footprint, okay? 
um, you can't escape it. <laughs> so so the, the best practices that we're giving you and, and encouraging you to build strong habits are going to help you regardless of whether you stay with Bomb Bomb or you go somewhere else, or you change your email address. Um, it's like a digital footprint and it really follows you around wherever you go. Um, Convic, I saw a question about what are your thoughts on sending to a cold list? I know I have some of my own thoughts and best practices on, on how to appropriately maybe send to a cold list, but I wanna hear from you first as the expert. Um, how would you most effectively and in a uh, healthy way engage a cold list? Define cold for me. Are we, are we talking about a, a really old list that opted in that's now gone cold? Or are we talking about a list of people that doesn't know who you are? Because if it's a list of people that's cold to who you are and doesn't know who you are, I would say don't send to them because that would fall under a categorization of public shared or purchased, uh, which would be against can spam um, and not according to our, our platform's terms. So, but if it is a cold list of people that you know, maybe you had been sending to, they are people that know who you are, had engaged with you in the past, um, but you haven't been sending to that list in a long time. Any suggestions on, on doing that in a healthy way? Yeah, I would uh, treat them like you would with uh, new leads, right? So a lot of times people that are, are like an older list that haven't heard from you in a long time have forgotten who you are. Uh, we have short memory spans as humans. Sometimes I forget the businesses I've interacted with or the people I interacted with at those businesses. So if they're going to email me, I'd rather not just get like a big, be part of like a big marketing blast. I would rather get like a one-to-one -one email first, kind of get re-pulled uh, into the fold, and then you can start to send me uh, larger marketing emails. But I would try to engage with those people with like a one-to-one -one more personal email first. Can you remind them of what it was that, what value you offered? Um, and can you do that like in a subject line? Hey, it's John from et cetera. Uh, just wanted to reach out in regards to that thing we talked about last year or whatever it is. So what? start personal. Yeah, start personal, always. <laughs> I think um, I want to answer one more because I think this is a, a question I've heard a lot. That I've seen it once or twice in the actual webinar here, but definitely before we finish up here is I've seen a lot of people ask, is it better to send from Gmail or a place like that versus sending from BombBomb? Bomb? Is there going to be a distinction as far as how your emails are delivered or them getting to the right place based on where you're sending from? Connor, what are your thoughts on that? Um, not necessarily. It's I, if you're doing personal emails, I would do those from Gmail. Um, but if you're sending, like if you're trying to send in larger, bulkier sends, it's going to be more difficult to do from Gmail. So that's why you have your platform like BombBomb. Um, but it's not going to be really seen as that much different. You can also connect your Gmail integration uh, in your BombBomb account, which will route uh, your sends up to 10 people in BombBomb through Gmail's mail servers, which is almost just like sending exactly from Gmail itself. Um, the other thing too I'd maybe consider is getting a uh, business email address. So like if you have something like your actual business domain, such as BombBomb.com versus sending from like a gmail.com address, especially if you're going to be sending more business related mail to larger amounts of people. Um, it kind of makes it to where you're more identifiable and more authenticated as that person. Awesome. Connor, thank you. You have brought, you have answered so many questions that I would never have been able to answer. So that's, that's why you're the expert. Thank you all for being here. I know we're already about 10 minutes over the hour past our time. So I want to make sure that we're respectful of your guys' time. Um, I know there's a lot of information in this. We went over a lot of details you will be getting a recording of this. So we will be emailing you a recording. Uh, I know Vivian's been posting some great articles and some great things that you can go to. So we will include that in the follow-up email. One other thing I wanted to mention that's a little bit newer for us, and we're gonna be talking about this, very excited in the next couple webinars here, but is our resource hub that we now have at BombBomb. For those of you that were asking about specific video examples, we actually have goal-based examples. We have role-based examples. If you want to look at your role, what you're doing and what other people are doing to win with that so that we don't start sending bad value and bad content that's not going to work. So if you go to bombbomb.com slash resource hub, you can find that. And there's lots of great resources to look at there. So thank you all so much. There's Connor's got the pup. He's pulling him up. Ray, I know you were asking about seeing Alicia's dog. So there you at least got one little puppy thing, but it's such a pleasure to work with you all. Thanks for being part of the Bomb Bomb family.
family here. Thanks for trusting us to, to try to work through some of this information. And we appreciate you all. Alicia, thank you. You brought so much expertise and wonderful aspects to this. You're just the best. That's part of my month. I love our bomb bomb family. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you guys for joining us, Convict. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. Bye.